you have any idea where he might be interested in going? I don't see him coaching for anyone else. I mean, not at this point. Not, you know, 68 years old. He is so well entrenched here in New England. He's got everything he could ever want here. Total autonomy. You know, they've just the whole operation runs so smoothly. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's not like the old days where NFL coaches are sleeping on their couches and just grinding away all the time. Belichick's got a pretty good work-life balance at this point. You know, his program is a well-oiled machine. Um, there are practice limits, you know, time limits in the off season. He still gets plenty of time on his boat and in, in Nantucket and playing the Pebble Beach Pro-Am and doing the charity circuit with Linda. Like he, he gets plenty of time to do all that. Um, and he's making a ton of money. Um, don't know for sure, but I know he's the highest paid coach and he's making a lot. So, you know, as long as he keeps winning games and, and he's got it set up like he does, I, I don't see him leaving anytime soon. And, and I honestly think he's kind of energized over the prospect of getting to rebuild the team again and building it up without Tom Brady and kind of proving to the world that he can build the Patriots into a winner again. Uh, I think it, it excites him. Uh, one thing I was told in the off season, Belichick told Parcells that he views this as a two year rebuild. So that by 2022, Belichick believes that the team will be humming again and ready to be a consistent winner. And look, in the meantime, they're, they don't have a whole lot of talent right now, but they're still five and six and they're still winning ball games. Um, so if they can, uh, you know, hit on a few draft picks, maybe have some, some fortuitous uh, free agent signings next year. Um, the Patriots certainly can be back on top, but um, you know, probably looking at another rebuilding year next year and they got to figure out quarterback um, Cam Newton, you know, he, he does some okay things, but he's obviously not the long-term answer. Um, I wouldn't be against them bringing him back next year, as long as they also draft a kid. Um, you know, Cam is not the answer, and he's regressing as a passer, and it's it's getting, you know, it's the highest scoring year in NFL history. Quarterbacks have never put up better stats, but Cam, you know, is, has four touchdown passes this year, or whatever it is, and, and they just they can't have no downfield passing attack. So they got to figure out quarterback. Um, it's an interesting dichotomy with the team they're playing this Sunday. They're playing the the Chargers, and the Chargers are three and eight. But I mean, they got their quarterback, so they're sitting pretty right now, and they're they're you know thrilled about the future. Whereas the Patriots, you know, have a better chance of making the playoffs this year, but their future is is very much uh, cloudy at the quarterback position. Uh, so that's that's Belichick's big uh, big task here over the next couple of years. Um, finding out the finding the next quarterback, grooming, developing, uh, and and finding someone that can keep the Patriots on top for several years. So Ben, um, I did some sports work in the early '90s in Cleveland, and, and my, one of my first interviews was with a guy named Bill Belichick. Ah, uh, yes. In those days, he was painful to get in front of the media. It was it was a painful. First of all, he couldn't understand half the things he was saying. He right. mumbled. Has he improved at all? Is he more accessible? I mean, he was, it, there was a real negative relationship between us and him. He, he just, and, and the second part of my question is, uh, with the firing Patricia this past week in Detroit, the Patriots tree, as they call it, doesn't seem to produce outside of New England. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of failure, a lot of hope that they could bring the Patriots system into it to another team, and it just doesn't work. Why? Yeah, it's funny. Um, the the Patriots coaches, uh, Belichick does not have a, a good record with his tree. And I think it's because when you look at the Patriots recipe for success, it's Belichick and it's Brady. I mean, Belichick is just like a savant and an unbelievable teacher and just knows, just breathes and lives the game. And I know all these coaches do, but I mean, Belichick, you know, was watching film and going on scouting trips with his dad as a young kid and just learned so much about the game and knows the rule book inside and out and the salary cap and just has such a wealth of knowledge that, you know, you can't replicate that. And then he's had the greatest quarterback of all time as well. And Tom Brady, the guy who's just never phased and never flustered in the fourth quarter. So Matt Patricia, a smart guy, good football coach, certainly learned a lot from Belichick. But if you're not bringing Bill with you and if you're not bringing Tom Brady with you, you're just another coach, to be honest. And, you know, Bill O'Brien, I think, had some good success, but he just wore people out with his personality. He's just very combative and always fighting with guys. And once they started 0-4 this year, it was like, you know, it was their excuse to get rid of him. 
The one guy who I think, uh, you know, they has, has a shot is Brian Flores down in, in Miami. He's, he's brought a good tough identity to that team and, and really instilled some good leadership there. Um, the one decision, the one thing I worry about with him is I, I think, you know, switching to Tua may may have been the wrong decision. I think they were going pretty strong with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Tua's hurt now, so it gives them the excuse to go back to Fitzy. But they're a good team. I mean, they score defensive and special teams touchdowns every week, and, and they build a good team. And I, I was surprised that they switched to Tua because I think it's pretty clear, like, right now, Fitzpatrick is the better quarterback. And I think he, he runs the risk of losing his locker room, like players being like, why are we not trying to win? And so, I, you know, the Flores certainly has, has got, gotten off to a good start, and he's a guy who could finally produce from the Belichick tree. But I just think, yeah, it's, the Patriots' success is mostly because of Belichick and Brady. If you're not bringing those two guys with you, like what – you're not getting you're not getting the essence of the Patriots. Um, sorry, what, what was your first question again? Interviewing Belichick these days, is he – yeah, I mean, obviously, he's been in front of, he's been on the podium and in front of the camera now for 20 years with the Patriots, plus his four years, five years with the Browns. So he's a lot more polished. The thing with Belichick is, like, every word is calculated and measured. So he's never – everything is said for a purpose and with a reason. He never just, like, lets things slip. And so there's always kind of hidden messages there. And, and you're really – you spend the time not only listening to what he says, but – trying to decipher the hidden meaning as well and what's he really saying here and is this a, a shot at Tom Brady or is he taking a shot at Mangini or is he you know what you know what is he saying about what's going on behind the scenes so but Belichick is very savvy now um, I, I wouldn't say he's Mr. Congeniality by any stretch but um, it's surprising like um, the thing about Belichick and I think you hear this a lot from players and coaches too is you never quite know where you stand with him uh, every time I think um, I, I'm in a great spot with him, he'll ignore me in the hallway and, or, you know, just like give me some curt answer and blow me off. And then every time I think he hates me, he's like, Hey, what's up, Ben? And he, you know, punched me in the arm and he'll bust my balls about something. And we might, we might talk about the Celtics game last night for five minutes. Like he's, he can be very, um, uh, uh, you know, chatty and conversational when he wants to be. And, you know, really, really smart, intelligent guy knows a lot about like military history and um, just a really fascinating, not your typical jock. So I would say, so, um, you know, having a front row seat to, you know, one of the greatest coaches in NFL history and just this fascinating all around guy has been, it's been unbelievable for me. And he can be very frustrating at times. Like the Patriots are so unnecessarily difficult with information. Like everything has to be a murder mystery. They can't just like, tell you why a guy is absent from practice sometimes but uh for what however frustrating it can be um it's still uh, quite a treat to to get a, a up close seat to this guy and to get to chronicle him and um you know like i said he'll surprise you like with some chattiness or with some stories or we we're sharing he was showing me his grandkids i was showing him my little kids one time like it's weird to see him as a human you almost think of him just as like some football robot sometimes We've got some uh, questions here in the chat. chat. I want to get to these here. Can I just uh, ask one question, though, uh, man? Sure. And, and along the same lines as uh, you were talking about, do you think the Patriots would uh, try and uh, move up the draft this year um, and try and get one of the young quarterbacks that are coming out, like Lawrence, for example? Do you think that would be a possibility to bring uh, – you know, what do they have to offer a, a team like, like uh, I don't know, like the Jets, <laughs> for example? That well, would... they're not getting Lawrence. Uh, he's oh. going to the Jets or the Jaguars. That's that's locked in. I mean, I don't think I don't think the Patriots could trade anything in the world to get one of those teams to give up Trevor Lawrence. So you can forget about that. But I have started doing a little bit of work on the draft class, and there's like five or six guys that are kind of in the first round mix right now. So I don't know if the Patriots are going to have to like trade up. I mean, they'll probably be picking anywhere from 15th to 20th, um, and they're might be a guy in that range um uh there's justin fields a kid from ohio state there's this kid trey lance from north dakota state um i asked the guy Dar daniel jeremiah he's the draft expert for nfl network he does the three-day draft bonanza for them and i asked him a couple weeks ago i was like of all these guys who do you think is the best fit for belichick and he loved the north dakota state kid he thought he's really tough they give him a lot of responsibility at the line of scrimmage Belichick loves getting these kids out of random schools, Jimmy Garoppolo from Eastern Illinois or whatever. 
So um, that was one vote for the North Dakota State kid. There's a kid from BYU, Zach Wilson. Uh, I like the kid from Florida. I'm a Gator, so I'm biased. But Kyle Trask has had a good year. There's a kid from Alabama, Mac Jones. So there, there's a, it looks to be a pretty decent quarterback class this year. To me, the question is, are the Patriots going to use their first-round pick on one, or would they take one in the second or third round? To me, Belichick always seems like a guy who wants to use kind of a, a first-round pick on a day-one player, like a guy that you, you know reasonably well how he's going to develop, an offensive lineman, a running back, a linebacker, a defensive lineman, a, you know, a front seven guy. To me, that just seems like Belichick's MO, and Belichick feels like, well, I got Garoppolo in the second round. I mean, obviously, he got Brady in the sixth. That's a little bit of a, uh, a wild card. But, you know, I, I would think that I would want Belichick to take a first-round pick because I feel like that's a position where it's all about the talent. And by far and away, the most, most quarterbacks in the league do come in the first round. Uh, but I, I could definitely see Belichick not doing that. But if he doesn't, I would really hope that he would take one in the second round. Um, they lost their third-round pick due to Spygate 2 this year. Uh, they are going to get a compensatory third round pick back, which is basically like pick 100. Um, but so they're not going to have a ton of trade ammo. They're going to have like the 16th pick and then probably the, um, you know, 50th pick or whatever, and then a hundred. So if they do want to trade up, they'll have to trade next year's one. And that doesn't seem like something Belichick would do. Um, so, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the quarterback. And, and I hope they do draft one because, I don't want to see them piece together another year with Cam Newton. Or I mean, they might have to play Cam next year if the rookie's not ready. But, you know, Cam has been okay, but he's not the answer. And whoever you get, if you trade, I don't want them to trade for Matt Stafford. I don't want to retread. I want them to draft and develop their own kid um, and be in a situation where they could have a quarterback for the next 10 years. So now, now why don't we start reading some of these in the chat. Uh, Gil Wolf. From a Buffalonian, uh, are the Bills getting any respect in Beantown these days, or are we still a punching bag, not even register? I think the Bills uh, have respect now. I mean, it's all, I don't hear too much talk about the Bills on talk radio or what have you, but, I mean, Sean McDermott's pretty, built a pretty solid program there. They're going to – on the verge of making the playoffs for the third time in four years, and um, I've been very surprised and impressed with what they've done with Josh Allen this year. I was not a Josh Allen fan. Thought he was too much of a roller coaster, uh, and he still is. I mean, he has some games that make you shake your head, and he has some some bad ball security at times. But um, they've really reined him in. And Brian Dable, the offensive coordinator, the, the former Patriot, he's been outstanding. And I think that's a great um, is a great example of the importance of continuity. Uh, you know, Josh Allen has had the same coordinator in the same system and pretty much the same teammates for going on three years now, and they're able to just continually build. Whereas so many of these young quarterbacks, like constantly switching head coaches and coordinators and systems and teammates. And it's a really tough way to develop when you're just constantly relearning things. Um, that said, I, I think that Josh Allen's coach, uh, Brian Dable, is probably going to be a, a hot head coaching candidate this year and he might get, end up getting a job. So he, he might have to have some change there in Buffalo. But they've, they've built a very respectable program. Still don't think they're on the level yet of the Chiefs. I don't think they're there with the Titans. Like, the Bills might win a playoff game, but that's probably their ceiling right now. But it's a heck of a lot better than what they used to be. And clearly they're the best team going in the AFC East right now. Now let's go to Aaron Altman. Uh, with cable and all the sports channels available, how important is sports coverage in print versus years ago? Um, good question. I think it's still important. I think that, you know, wh whether it's print or online, I think the coverage is still important now. Um, the tone of the coverage has changed a lot. Whereas before, even when I got into the industry in 2004, um, you know, was, the in, internet was obviously a growing uh, thing, but it was, you know, people were still reading the newspaper for information. And so like people were reading game stories to find out what happened. Whereas now everyone has seen it. It's, you know, it's, even if they didn't watch the game, they DVR'd it or they're watching the highlights on Twitter or whatever. So just my coverage has tuned into has switched from just recapping what happened to really trying to explain what happened and do more analysis and have more opinions and back them up with facts and to try to go deeper into the game than just the surface level stuff. And that can be a challenge, 
especially with the Patriots who are very difficult to deal with. And like I said, everything's a murder mystery. They can't just like, you know, like I remember, um, if you remember the 2008 season, the Dolphins came in and they unveiled the Wildcat and they, and they beat the uh, Patriots 38, 13, you know, this formation came out of nowhere and they came into Gillette and just beat the pants off the Patriots. Worst, worst loss Belichick ever had at home. And I was covering the Dolphins at the time. So we went into the locker room and uh, they're like, Oh yeah, we call it the Wildcat and we were working on it in training camp. And we were really going to try to put it in week one, but then Ronnie Brown broke his thumb. So that set us back a couple weeks. And then when we were on the plane, so they're just, you know, they're happy to describe things for you. Cause like, whatever, we all saw it and it's out there. The Patriots, you know, they're just like, well, you know, we'll, we'll worry about it. They just refuse to give you any sort of details on anything. So what I have found um, many times is I, I go to the visitor's locker room. Yeah, the Patriots won't tell me what happened, but the Titans will tell me what happened. And they'll be happy to – especially if the Titans beat the Patriots, they'll be happy to tell me all the stuff that the Patriots are trying to run and how the Titans countered it. So I've had my best interviews and my best, you know, insight from going into the other team's locker room just because – the Patriots are so hush hush and tight lipped and, and, and they really try not to give you too much insight. Um, but so that, that's the big challenge uh, today is not just recapping the game and just not just recapping the quotes, but actually trying to go deeper inside the game and really try to uh, explain things better and provide more analysis. Um, and Aaron has a follow-up. Is there any regret in Boston about Brady leaving? I think a lot of people are upset that Brady left. Um, you know, it was kind of time. I mean, I, I, do, I do think after 20 years, I'm impressed that he was able to put up with Belichick for 20 years. I'm impressed that Belichick was kind of able to put up with Brady's diva-ness at the end. So they made it work for a long time. And we see all these teams now. I mean, they look – I mean, look at the Seattle Seahawks. They were an amazing team, and they fell apart so quickly. And the Steelers have never, never been able to have the success – that the Patriots have had and the Ravens felt it's like these teams are, are all great for a year or two, the Eagles, but they can't keep it going the way the Patriots have. So it's pretty impressive. Um, that said, I think, I, I think uh, Brady sometimes, you know, questions like what the heck am I doing down here? Like, I think he has a better appreciation for Belichick discipline and his coaching style. Now um, Brady has the run of the hen house down there. He, he has to pick his own players and pick his own plays and run the offense how he wants it. And you want Antonio Brown? Sure, go get Antonio Brown. But it's not working. And they are one of the worst teams in the league in pre-snap penalties. And Bruce Arians just, you know, does not have the same discipline um, that Belichick does. And then, you know, Arians is kind of calling out Brady in these press conferences and telling the world that Brady missed a coverage and missed a throw. And so I think Brady – has a better appreciation for the Patriots a little bit. And I don't think he regrets leaving. It was time. And I don't think the Pat the Patriots didn't exactly want him back. They, I think made him a token offer and made it clear that they were ready to move on. And he was definitely ready to move on. So, you know, he got everything he wanted in Tampa, but I think he has a better appreciation um, uh, for Belichick. And I think Belichick, you know, I, I don't think he didn't appreciate Brady, but I think we as fans appreciate it. We see Cam Newton come up short every week in the fourth quarter. You know, every week he's fumbling in Buffalo, getting stuffed in Seattle, or, you know, just stalling against Denver. It's like every week they come up small in the fourth quarter. They finally did it against the Cardinals, but that was a gift. I mean, they they got a super lucky gift with that with that penalty, and otherwise we're probably going over time, and who knows. So um, we certainly have a much better appreciation for Brady and how good, you know, he was in the fourth quarter because – you know, just one or two of these games went a different way. And the Patriots are right, you know, in the, in the playoff mix right now. So um, certainly seeing Brady go down to Tampa, I, I wrote this column a couple weeks ago, Brady needs Bill and Bill needs Brady. And, and I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, Paul Brownstein asks, uh, what's my opinion of Joe judge and Paul's a Brown, a Giants fan, as you can imagine. Um, I mean, he's, he's learned at the foot at the best. Uh, he is, he's a disciple of Bill Belichick and Nick Saban because he worked at Alabama uh, for a few years. So he's, he's certainly learned from the best and he's a hard ass. I mean, he is really instilling some discipline and some tough love down there in New York. And it's kind of like Brian Flores, where I think the first year is really about weeding out the players that don't fit in the program. And then, um, you know, instill, instilling the culture there 
um, and and the you know just establishing the way to the processes and the way to do things, and then you know hopefully building towards starting next year they can start to be more competitive. Now they're lucky that they play in a terrible division; they're actually leading the division. They might make the playoffs right now. I hope they don't use that as any sort of like sign of success because they they still have a long way to go and they've got a lot of rebuilding to do. Um, I saw Bill Parcells did an interview with uh, Newsday on Long Island a couple weeks ago, and he said he loves Joe Judge. So if I'm a Giants fan, if he has Parcells' blessing, that's good enough for me. Um, now, Judge has to be careful. He, you know, Matt Patricia learned this. Joe, uh, Josh McDaniel learned this. Like, you can be a hard ass, and, like, it works if you're Bill Belichick and you've got six Super Bowl rings and all the credibility in the world. It definitely does not work as well when you're Joe Judge and you're 38 and uh, you're a first-time coach and it didn't work for McDaniels. So, you know, it's working now, but the, the whole tough love, hard ass thing, you got to be careful with it. And it, It's basically what just got Bill O'Brien fired. So at the end of the day, it's still going to be about wins and losses. Um, and they're, they don't have a good uh, record right now, but he's at least, you know, establishing some culture and some discipline and, and getting that team going in the right direction. Um, all right. Elliot Feldman asked, do I know the, do I know the real with, Bill Belichick and Malcolm Butler. This is the million dollar question gets asked every single time. If I actually knew, uh, I promise you, you all would know as well. I would not sit on that information. I would report it. Uh, I do not have the definitive story about what happened. I don't know if we ever will. Belichick to his credit has not kind of leaked it out through any, you know, back channels, your secret media friends. Like I thought he actually, even though he um, kind of crushed Malcolm Butler on that day by ben benching in front of the world, he still kind of did Malcolm a solid by not explaining what happened, still kind of defending Malcolm Butler. And then Malcolm got a, a good free agent contract anyway. So all's well that ends well. Um, I, I think if it was a definitive incident and we've heard all kinds of rumors, he punched Belichick's kid in the face. He slept with Belichick's kid's wife. He got caught partying during Super Bowl week, all, all this stuff. I think if it was something definitive like that, it would have come out. Um, I, so I don't think it was anything like that. I think it was kind of – Malcolm Butler said it in the days after – or when he signed with the Titans, he kind of said it in his, um, in his press conference with the Titans. He said, like, you know, I, I didn't have my most consistent season. He was definitely kind of up and down that year. The contract stuff was definitely affecting him. And he didn't have a great week at practice. And then he got sick and he missed the team flight. And I don't think he was supposed to miss the team flight. I think Belichick was kind of taken aback by it. And so I think Belichick, I don't think he said you're benched. I think he just demoted him to a certain role, to the fourth cornerback, you know, punt team, the, the role that Johnson Batamosi had. And, he, and, you know, everyone else just moved up a spot on the depth chart. So I think that's what happened. And then just the way that game unfolded, Butler's number never got called. Um, now I don't, Belichick knows about the situation more than any of us. So I don't fault him for benching Butler and I'm not ready to say they would have won the game if he played, but I do fault Belichick and not making the adjustment and not going to Butler in the second half. He couldn't have been worse than Batamosi. He couldn't have been worse than Jordan Richards. And this is a guy, even if he did have an up and down season, Belichick still relied on him 98% of the plays that year. So I, I the one mistake I think Belichick absolutely made and uh, he, he will, you know, forever have to deal with it was he never made the adjustment in the second half and he's the king of mid game adjustments and he just didn't do it. So, you know, we're now, I don't know if we're ever going to get the full story, but that's, that's kind of my read on the whole thing. Um, boy, another giants question. Will the giants ever get back to being a super bowl? <laughs> a lot of giants talk. Um, it's all about Daniel Jones. I liked him as a rookie. I think he's kind of regressed this year, but again, that's the thing I was talking about. Um, second year in the league and he's already got on his second offensive coordinator with Jason Garrett. Um, who do you have last year? Pat Shermer. So I, I liked Daniel Jones last year. I thought he showed some good awareness in the pocket, read the field well, made some good throws, all that stuff. But he's been kind of a turnover machine this year and, uh, has certainly regressed, but um, you know, maybe that's the system. Who knows? But it's, it's all going to be about Daniel Jones. Uh, they've got to get some better play from him. They've got to get a lot better offensive line play before they can start uh, worrying about Super Bowls. Uh, is there anyone uh, want to ask a question before I start reading more? Going once, going twice. 
All right, uh, Tom Sudo. So I hope I said that right. Yep. Who was my best interview? It's a great question. Um, I mean, I love Devin McCourty. Devin McCourty is like probably the only player on the Patriots I still interview consistently. Um, he, you know, very, very smart, always gives interesting answers. The thing with the Patriots um, is they're kind of like the military, which is not surprising because Bill Belichick grew up in the Naval Academy um, environment where if you're new, it doesn't matter if – now Cam, Cam is the one guy that's broken the mold because he's the team leader and the quarterback. He's been given some latitude to talk. But any you know, new free agent or certainly a rookie, you say as little as possible. They, the Patriots coach you up on media more than any other team. That's what players always say. And so new guys, they say nothing. But if you've been here for, for a few years and you've proven yourself, then you have the latitude to, you know, to, to be more open and honest. And that's where Devin McCourty is. Like, he, you don't want to talk about anything going on with COVID or what happened in the game. Like, Devin McCourty is your go-to. Just a really great guy. has a really good head on his shoulder. Always has interesting answers. So I, I love uh, interviewing him. Um, the other guy, it's, it's going to sound weird to say, I used to love interviewing Richie and Kamita. I covered right. him with the Dolphins. And I know he got into some bad trouble with uh, the whole Bullygate thing. Um, but I loved Richie. He was, he was a, a ball buster, you know, and I definitely understand, like, he took it way too far with Jonathan Martin. But um, Richie was a smart guy, and he was always known as a hothead. And I was, like, intimidated by him at first. But he, he was, a, again, a, like, you get him away from the football field, like a really smart guy, really well-spoken, uh, definitely has some demons that he deals with. But um, – I've stayed friends with him to this day. I've always, I've always rooted for Richie Incognito and he must be like the most talented guard in the universe. Cause he's been kicked off of so many teams and suspended and, and he's like 36 and still getting jobs. So he, he must be really good. Cause he keeps getting, um, keeps getting jobs. Uh, Brady's been, it, Brady was always an interesting interview. You know, he's a guy who lives on a different planet from us, like celebrity wise. And, you know, he always went one day a week. It was usually Wednesday. Sometimes he would go on a Friday for his press conference. But, like, sometimes on a Thursday, you know, I might have a question I want to ask him not in front of the rest of the group. And he'd just be sitting in his locker and be like, hey, Tom, I've got one question. It's about Jacoby Brissett. Mind if I ask you real quick? And he'd give you the time of day, and he'd look you in the eye, and he'd give you a real answer. And, you know, he, didn't, he definitely didn't have to do that. So I, I always thought – you know, Brady, for a guy who's a super celebrity, could still be kind of down to earth and, and pretty normal. So I always um, respected that out of him. Um, and Martellus Bennett. Martellus Bennett was always a crack up. Um, always went to him for a, a good one-liner or something. But uh, they haven't had too many good guys like that in the locker room these days. Like, he, he was not – like, Chad Johnson got – he got neutered in his one year. You barely heard from him when he was – but, but Martellus Bennett was – uh, a cut up and certainly a character and, and we miss guys like him. So, so those are, those are a few of the, the good interviews I've had. Uh, David and Debbie from Kansas city, which teams do I see is capable of a playoff run? And I'll assume you mean like a Super Bowl run. I think the chiefs are the favorites right now. They're a really good team. Uh, defense is a little shaky, but they've got more than enough offense. I know the Steelers are ahead of them. Um, 11 and 0, you can't fake that. So the Steelers are obviously a good team but I don't think they have enough offense to keep up with the chiefs. I think the Steelers have kind of gotten away with maybe a soft schedule a little bit. Um, Roethlisberger has been protecting the ball this year, but they've been kind of a dink and dunk offense and they really struggled against the Ravens today. So I, I think the Steelers might be prime in the AFC. I'm looking at the chiefs and the Titans. I really like what Vrabel has built there. I think Tannehill has been awesome. I can't believe how good he's, he's become in Tennessee. I mean, obviously with Derrick Henry, uh, he's a force. And then Tannehill and, and A.J. Brown, the big passing game, like that is a really efficient, fun offense. Uh, and if they can get that defense figured out, um, I like Vrabel as a coach. I think he's got some big set of brass ones on him. I, I like that he came into Gillette and took down Belichick and used some of his clock manipulation tactics against him. Like it's a lot of coaches wilt in that situation. And Vrabel's just got some big stones. Uh, so I really like the Titans and I really like the Chiefs. Um, NFC, the Saints are really coming on. Their defense has been lights out. Um, I think they need Drew Brees back. Uh, I don't think they're, they're going to be able to do it with Taysom Hill as, as the starter, but assuming Brees comes back from his cracked ribs, you got to like the Seahawks. And then whoever comes out of the NFC West, I think is going to be 
really battle tested. I even though the the Rams had a bad loss to the Niners the other day, I've been very impressed with Sean McVay's team. Like they played a, a few national TV games, they always show up. They're always well, well prepared. And this is the fourth year now that he's been running that team, and their offense has not been figured out, which I think is very impressive. Like you look at the Eagles, the league has definitely figured out. Carson Wentz and Doug Peterson's offense, but Sean McVay is still rolling there with the Rams. I just think that he's a really good coach, and that team is always well prepared. Seattle's going to be tough. Even Arizona, uh, bad loss to the Patriots, but Arizona's going to be tough. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think you're looking at the Saints and then those NFC West teams. Um, so th- those are probably the elite teams that I think have a realistic shot at the Super Bowl. I don't, I don't see the Bucks as a Super Bowl team. They are a dysfunctional mess right now. I just, I can't believe how bad they're playing on offense. Um, ever since they brought Antonio Brown aboard, it's the whole thing is just gone in the crapper. And uh, that team is a mess seven and five. They're not even a lock for the playoffs right now. Um, they, you know, they have two games left against Atlanta. Atlanta's on fire right now with inter- with their interim coach. They just beat the Raiders by 37 points. So neither of those games against the Falcons will be easy. The Vikings have won three and four, uh, three and four. That won't be an easy game for the Bucks, and they're losing games at home. They're, you know, anytime they play a good team, they're getting, you know, their doors blown off. So the Bucks are just a mess. And I know there was all this hype for them in the beginning of the season, but I mean, they're probably looking at a road game in the playoffs and one and done, maybe one more win, but that is definitely not looking like a Super Bowl team right now. Um, now let's go to Eric Golub. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Oh, sorry. You, do, uh, will the Giants ever get, get back to being a playoff and Super Bowl contending team again? Again, it's it's all going to be about Daniel Jones, and I, I think they're probably a little far away from that right now, especially on the offensive line. From uh, Bob Braitman, uh, do I get a chance to watch TV coverage? Who are my favorite announcing commentator teams? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I watch a lot of games. Um, usually uh, during the season, obviously, I'm – uh, in normal years, I'm at wherever the Patriots are playing. And so I can only watch games kind of around. If, if they're playing a one o'clock game, I'm probably not watching the four o'clock games. I'll be up in the press box typing. The game will be on, but I'm not really watching it. But I'll watch the Monday night game, the Sunday night game, the Thursday night game. Uh, but then this year with COVID, um, I, I could in theory go to the games and we do send the Globe, uh, we do send at least one writer to every game, even the road games. But uh, I've chosen to not go. Uh, all the interviews are done uh, on Zoom this year. So the only reason to go to the game is, I don't know, in case something happens or be, to be able to see things that the TV cameras don't show. But to be honest, I think you see the game better on TV than you do from the press box, which in many stadiums is like the corner of the end zone and the upper deck, and you got to get your binoculars out just to see stuff. So I like, you know, first of all, I, I'd stay from I, – I chose not to go to any games this year just because uh, of my family – I got two little kids at home uh, and we send them to daycare five days a week and daycare has been a godsend. And if I get COVID, we got to keep the kids home from daycare for two weeks. And, you know, it's just a big burden on everyone. So I just don't want to deal with that. Um, And I hate to say it because number one rule of journalism is you go to the events and you you never cover things from your couch, but I've been really efficient this year um, doing everything from home. Uh, Like a Belichick press conference on a Wednesday, it might be at nine o'clock in the morning. And so to get, to get down to Foxborough, I'll leave the house at seven forty to take my kids to school. Then I'll drop them off. And then I go, I have to drive down there. And then by the time I get home, it won't be, you know, it'll be 10 o'clock. So it's like a two and a half hour round trip for like a 15 minute press conference. Whereas now Belichick's at nine and I roll it down into my office it's at eight fifty eight. I log on to zoom and like, boom, I'm there and I'm done. Can start working right away. I watch all the games from home. Um, I log on to Zoom right away. I crank out my articles. I can then watch Tom Brady. I've, I've covered two games in one day when the Patriots and the Bucks are at separate times. I've covered both games. So, you know, it's, it's kind of breaking all the rules of journalism, but it's been very efficient this year. And um, it's been nice to have the family time and everything. So, I, you know, I hope in the future we go back to traveling and back to normal. But it's been nice this year. Um, Favorite announcing team? I really like Ian Eagle and, and Charles Davis. Uh, Ian is just a real smooth play-by-play guy. I love Kevin Harlan. I mean, the guy turns, you know, a second and seven run play into the most exciting play ever. I mean, Kevin Harlan, I just love his excitement. Um, Collinsworth and Michaels are solid. Uh, they, 
Um, I'm not as big a fan of Tony Romo as other guys are. Sometimes uh, he, all he does is, you know, is, Ooh, ah, Ooh, it's like, it's a little much sometimes, but uh, when he, when he predicts those plays, it's unbelievable. He's like a Svengali up there. Just like he sees the formation and the defense. He knows exactly what's going to happen. Um, but, but yeah, those are, those are probably some of my, uh, my top announcing teams. Um, Can I just follow up um, while, uh, while you're looking for the next question? We yeah. had a guest earlier in the year, another sports writer, who was talking about the fact that when he's covering a game live, he actually doesn't see the game as well as he did when he was watching it on a TV screen because he was often either behind cameras or uh, behind people, and he, he just felt that the experience of covering the game wasn't as uh, intimate, in a sense, as he felt when he was actually able to watch it on a TV screen. I, you know, I, I think it depends the on the sport. Box. I think it depends on the sport. I think in like in baseball, I think there's so much kind of going on um, that you want to be there. Football. It's, I don't know, football. It, it's, it's definitely beneficial to be there. You can see when guys leave injured or getting worked on, on the sideline or, you know, like when you watch a game at home, you're just dependent on whatever the TV camera show you. And, you know, they're, they're partners with the league. So, um, you know, if there's like, you know, they might tune away from something or they might, you know, purposely not show you something that is, you know, important, you want to see it. So it can be good, but yeah, I mean, when, uh, you know, especially now, like the press box, you know, there are a few stadiums left like Baltimore and Tennessee where the press box is like club level, you're sitting 50 yard line. It is, it is a sweet view of the game. And so I wouldn't, you know, that is unbelievable. But like for the Patriots, you're up in the, you know, basically the upper deck and you're in the corner of the end zone and it's a terrible you know, it's a terrible view of the game and you absolutely get a better view of the action on TV. And a lot of times when I'm covering games from the press box, I'll stream the game on my computer because not only do you get tighter views of the action and they'll zoom in on Belichick and you'll see Belichick mouthing something in McDaniels or whatever that you certainly can't see in the press box. Um, but like, every, you know, 99% of your audience is consuming the game through the TV. And so if they, if something is said or something like you want to, you want to know what's going on. You want to know what your, your readers and your fans are watching too. So even if you're at the game, I think you have to watch the game and at least be cognizant of what's going on in the broadcast. Cause that's, what's going out to the world. Um, so yeah, I definitely think you get a, I consume a game better on TV. I get a better feel for it on TV, but there are, you know, you're dependent on what the camera show you. And, you know, a lot of times it is good to be there in person just to, um, see it for yourself and then obviously to do interviews I miss being able to work the locker room go to the other team's locker room like right now we're just dependent on the three or four guys that each team provides on zoom and so after a game you're only talking to four guys whereas after a typical game the whole locker room's open and you can you can get guys in the locker room and get guys out in the parking lot by the team bus you can talk to their parents or their girlfriend like you can get much better insight uh, after the game uh, than obviously than you can now um, all right, so uh, let, Elliot Davis asked best best Patriot trade and worst Patriot trade. Um, I have to think about this. They did one a couple years ago. They traded a second round pick for Coney Ely, the defensive end, and then they uh, cut him before the season. So just a total waste. Um, that wasn't great. Um, I might have to come back to that. I can't think off the top of my head. Who, who some, oh, I mean, Mohamed Sanu was brutal. Gave up a second round pick. Did and you know maybe it's because he got hurt last year and, and that hurt his development with the team, but wasted a second round pick on a guy and got nothing. And and the Jimmy Garoppolo trade, brutal. I mean, you gave up a franchise quarterback for the forty third overall pick. Um, I don't disagree with trading him, but what they they absolutely should have traded him after that Falcon Super Bowl and before that draft. If you had gotten the Niners and the Browns and the Bears involved, you could have easily gotten at least a first round pick, if not more. And even, even then, when they traded him at the trade deadline, Belichick didn't call anyone else. He just handed him to the 49ers on a platter. So, um, you know, the, the Patriots, it's bizarre. They've had, they had a wealth of quarterbacks. That 2016 season, they had Brady and Garoppolo and Brissett, three quality quarterbacks, and they got nothing out of any of it. They traded Garoppolo. They, they traded um, Brissett for Dorsett, who's like a number four receiver. And then they traded Garoppolo for a second round pick. And, and then they let Brady walk and didn't get anything for him except for a big fat uh, 
dead cap hit this year on the salary cap. So they had all these great uh, resources at, at quarterback and completely squandered them. And now we're left with the corpse of Cam Newton and Jared Stidham and Brian Hoyer. And they, you know, who knows what the quarterback situation is situation is going to be so they had the best situation in the league and now they're just like all these other teams where they don't know what the future is going to hold uh, as for a best trade um welker was a trade that was for a second and a seventh i believe so that was a great deal randy moss i mean that was an unbelievable trade uh so those are the two that, that come to mind uh, right off the top of my head um it looks like we only got one more question here. It's from Eric Golub again. Oh, and someone else just asked what I think of Rob Gronkowski's attempt at pro wrestling. You know, I give him credit. Uh, he's built a, a good brand for himself and a persona. And Gronk is, uh, you know, a lot of these football players, you don't hear for them, from them in their post careers unless they're doing football commentating or whatever. But Gronk is going to be just fine. He's going to do more pro wrestling and he's going to sell shake weights and blenders and Gronk theme this and Gronk theme that and um I, I think he's gonna be just fine for himself and uh he was another guy like you know kind of a meathead and and you know you think of him as this like party guy but he was always one of the Patriots top workers they never had a problem with him the only time they had a problem with him was when he wanted a new contract and he'd hold out in the offseason but he always did his work he always showed up for his rehab he always did everything they needed him to do never got in trouble with with all of you know the the partying that he does, you never, not once has he done anything that's gotten him in trouble or gone viral or whatever. So, you know, pretty impressive all the way around. And um, he, that's a guy who's just a great Patriot. And uh, I didn't, I never blamed him for wanting, uh, you know, more money. I, I always thought that um, he, he kind of had a raw deal with his contract and I never, you know, if you can have leverage and go get more money, go do it. Um, I don't blame him for wanting to go to Tampa and, and, um, you know, rejoin up with Tom Brady. But I think it also shows you that uh, the wrestling wasn't the most lucrative career because, you know, he came back to football and he, he's making $9 million here in the NFL. No, no one's going to say no to that. Um, but, you know, I give Gronk credit and he's going he's gonna to have a nice off-field kind of life set up for him, just not necessarily doing one thing, but just kind of being Gronk and selling the Gronk experience. Um, Steven Schrago, hopefully I said that right, says, uh, when he returns, will Sony Michelle take time from Damian Harris? And I think that's an emphatic no. And in fact, uh, Sony Michelle is back. He was active last game for the first time against the Cardinals, played one snap and got no carries. It's all Damian Harris and James White. And that's what it should be. Never been a big fan of Sony Michelle, not understood what the Patriots saw in him to draft him in the first round. He's been very decidedly average. Um, there are much better running backs out there that were drafted way lower than he was. Uh, the guy in, in Cleveland, Nick Chubb, drafted right after Sonny Michel, uh, is a prime example. Uh, he's He's been hurt. He doesn't have explosion. He's not good in the passing game. He's This is his third year. He's got one more next year. I, I assume they'll let him run out his contract, and then they'll be done with him. He'll be four years and done. He's fine. He's not bad, but he's nothing special. And that was a waste of our first round pick. And Damian Harris can play. Um, I think it was very telling when the year after they drafted Sonny Michelle, they drafted Damian Harris in the third round as well. And I was surprised that Harris didn't really play last year, but he's, he's showing his stuff this year and he runs hard and, um, you know, runs with good power, gets yards after contact. I really like Damian Harris and they do too. So I don't see Sonny Michelle. Uh, getting his job back anytime soon. Uh, Bob Paritman, another question. Are refs overcalling interference penalties this year? I don't know. I, I don't know the data on that on the top of my head. I know um, for most of the year, the penalties were way down. Like this was on pace to be the lowest penalized season kind of in the modern era, like in the last 20 years. And like penalties were way down, especially on offense. The Patriots, I think it took them four games before they finally committed a penalty on offense. And uh, the referees had de definitely adopted a, you know, clear and obvious standard for holding and for pass interference and things of that nature where they, you know, they really kept the flags in their pocket and it's led to more points and more exciting games. And I think that's what fans want. Um, now, that said, I, I did look at the stats a couple of weeks ago and the, the penalties were way up. So I think they're starting to revert to, to the mean a little bit and they are starting to call more penalties, but 
you know, are they calling too much interference? I, I don't know the numbers on that. I think they're generally, the penalty calls are generally good. You're always going to have a few kind of wacky calls and guys, you know, I know Patriots fans were complaining about that blindside block against the Cardinals. I think if you look at the letter of the rule, they got it right. That's the exact kind of hit they're trying to legislate out of the game. Those are the hits that lead to concussions and injuries and stuff. Um, so you're always going to have some screwy calls, but, uh, you know, I think the refs have done a pretty good job this year and they didn't have preseason either. You know, this is uh, preseason is necessary for the officials as well. And they didn't get it. So I think they've done a pretty good job overall. And uh, that looks like all the questions in the queue right now. If anyone's got some more. Well, we're almost at nine o'clock. So uh Let's see, do we have any? Anyone else? I, you can, I can take everyone off. You can take yourself off mute if you would like to ask Ben a question. So, Ben, if you were going to start a franchise, if you needed one quarterback to put into a franchise, Brady, Mahomes, Rodgers, would you pick Brady or do, you, or do the others pile up at that point in time? I mean, are we talking Brady 2001 or Brady 2020? In their All three in their prime. I mean, I'd probably take Mahomes. Kid's unbelievable. Um, you can't argue with Brady's success. And, and Rodgers, Rodgers has always kind of had the mantle as the most talented quarterback of all time, whereas Brady's the best winner. Um, and, it, you know, his fourth quarter um, skills and just mastery of the two-minute drill are unbelievable. But Mahomes is incredible. And I don't know if he's going to win six Super Bowls, but he is – he's just – so good. I mean, he, there's nothing he can't do. He's got the strongest arm. He's a great athlete, great runner, just knows the game, great leader. I love everything about Mahomes. And already, you know, he's 25 years old. He's already won an MVP in the Super Bowl. I think he might win the MVP again this year. I think they might get back to the Super Bowl again this year. The kid is unbelievable. He's a great match with Andy Reid. They're going to be dangerous for a long time. So, I, you know, you can't go wrong with any of those guys. I'd probably rank him Mahomes, Brady, Rodgers. That's, that's probably what I would pick. Can we get him on the Patriots? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, we I, wish. Uh, if you Every got a, first uh, round if they have a half billion dollars they want to pay him, then maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> so, all right. <clears throat> all right. David, David, take yeah. it away. Sure. All right. So, Ben, I really want to thank you. This has been absolutely phenomenal. For me, it's a big deal because I'm a big Patriot fan. So, oh, you are? A, I didn't oh, know yeah, that. Oh, yeah, Danny, you guys never knew that. None of you guys know that, right? About I couldn't tell. Couldn't tell. Yeah, so couldn't this tell, is, could you? This is a, I have no idea. This is um, a uh, national or international because we have Canada represented. We, have, we do have Canada. But, yes, we uh, do. But most people on the call are from the Boston area. But I, I, so on behalf of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, I really want to thank you for being on here. Um, Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs sponsors affinity programs and um, – Sports affinity is a really big deal for us. It's the number one thing we do for our affinity programs. And you were absolutely phenomenal. I really, and I was riveted every second just listening to you. Um, you know, I've listened to you on the radio. So, and I've seen you live in Worcester. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, it, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's just absolutely, I'm sitting here at Cavelli. It's, it's really nice. It's, it's right. Cavelli. So, no. uh, Ben, a couple of things, if you could uh, send uh, me uh, or David, and you can send us me your email. We would like to dedicate a wine on the vine for you, which is uh, a program that we we actually plant vines in Israel. It's an FJMC uh, program that we've started up, and we've done that for all of our guests in your honor. So that's number one. And then um, number two, as I, we started the webinar, if you guys have missed a little bit, um, this is a very special month for us because we have back-to-back -back action. So next week, we're going to visit a sports that we haven't uh, had yet, and that is hockey. And uh, Rick, my partner, Rick Ronsberg, was uh, lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to procure us Kevin Shea, who in Canada, I know, is a really big deal. Uh, he's a hockey historian and best-selling author of 17 hockey books, including The Hall, Celebrating Hockey's Heritage and Home. And he's going to tell us all about the Stanley Cup and traveling and what it's like to, to, to live in, in the hockey world up in Canada. And that's next Tuesday. So same time, same place, only six days later. Um, and uh, that's it. All right.
Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out tonight. And, and thank you guys for having me. This is really oh, neat. Our thank pleasure. you so ben, much. Ben, thank you. This was great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good night now, Thanks. everyone. Good night, all. Danny. Thanks. Night. Thank you. Good job, Kravitz. Yeah, thank you, Danny. I gave it a shot. You know how it is. <laughs> Good job, David. Can you and Elliot stay on? You know, I want to discuss, you know. Uh, you, need, yes. you need my email for that wine on the vine thing? Please, please. We, uh, David, you have my email, right? I do have it. Okay. Do you need me to yeah, send I, you another one? or? I, you should send I him have. another one just in case. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. That would be a good idea. <laughs> okay. No problem. I can do that, too. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, really really Ben. Uh, read you tomorrow, I guess. You'll be in tomorrow on the Globe? Would you uh, I won't have an article probably till Sunday. Uh, All right. Well, I guess I'll read it then. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. See ya. Nice job.